one of the one and one and a half to a room, something like that, yeah. Sometimes I missed doing it. Okay, so we started talking about waves and bars, and we're, the kind of waves we're talking about are longitudinal waves, right? So if you've got a, a bar, we're talking about the waves where the motion, the wave motion is like this, and the same along, along the bar here. And we derive the standard wave equation. <coughs> here it is, two space derivatives. This can see here is the displacement of, of a little bit of mass, and it, it obeys the wave equation, two spatial derivatives, two time derivatives. We have the speed of waves here, and it's given by the square root of the Young's modulus. It's a, um, you know, it's a, an elastic mo modulus. You can look it up, divided by the density here. And incidentally, this is true when the wavelength is large compared to the diameter, so that the material can bulge. The Young modulus here, that's part of the Young's modulus. When you it's basically a stiffness you, that you could measure when you compress or expand some material and you allow it to, you know, when you, when you compress it, you allow it to bulge. The other types of, the other limit is unidirectional waves. This is where the material can't bulge, which occurs when the wavelength is very small. It's essentially an infinite medium. So that, we can, as I mentioned yesterday, early on, we can deal with that. Uh, all we have to do is replace the Young's modulus here with the modulus of unilateral extension and compressed pressure, bigger value. Now I forgot to mention something yesterday, and it's not in the notes here. Where's the cross-sectional area here? It, it cancels out, and you can see why it cancels out. For some motion here, if we double the cross-sectional area, we're going to double the force. You know, due to a strain here, if we double the area, there's going to be twice the force. But we've got twice the inertia. So if we increase the diameter, if, if we double the cross-sectional area here, for, a given, for some given displacement here, the force is proportional to cross-sectional area, but the mass is proportional to cross-sectional area. So Newton's second law tells us they're going to cancel. It's the same, it's similar to, you know, when I drop something in, in a vacuum and it has an acceleration g. If I double the mass, how does the acceleration change? It's similar, not, not real close. How does the acceleration change? It doesn't. And why doesn't it change? This was a discovery you know, hundreds of years ago. Well, the, what's driving this is the the gravitation, the weight, the gravitational force, which is proportional to mass. But the inertia is also proportional to mass. That's slowing up in the acceleration. And the two it cancel each other, just like, you know, in Newton's second law, just like the cross-sectional area does here. So I never thought about it before, but let me ask you guys this following, this will be good to put on a quiz maybe, but, uh, suppose I have a bar here. Right? It's got some material. This is some material, some cross-sectional area. And then, all of a sudden, I have this abrupt, this dis discontinuity here. I have the same material, but a, let's say, a greater cross-sectional area. And now I have a wave coming down here. What's going to happen? <laughs> this is not really, in, I think this is counterintuitive. Wave speed's the same. <laughs> Yeah, so um, the answer is it's just there's no reflection. Now, one way to appreciate that is we haven't done it yet, but it's, we did it for a string, and it's, the same thing's going to happen here. What is the impedance, the wave impedance here, you know, for an infinitely long? It's going to be rho c, just like it is for a string. Okay? So there's no change in impedance here because the density is the same, the speed of sound, speed of waves is the same. So I can't wait to ask some of my colleagues this. They're going to get it, I think they're going to get it wrong. I think it's, I, it's, it's amazing. So I just wrote this down to, to remind myself. There'd probably be some nonlinear effects in reality though near those d discontinuous points, right? Yeah, you know, the, the amazing, Again, I think this is amazing. What if we, so what if we yeah. do this? Yeah. 
what's going to happen. Now, most of the, this is even better for my colleagues because they're going to say, oh, in the wavelengths, if they're going to start thinking about what's important here is the wavelength compared to the transition region here. When the wavelength, and this is people in underwater acoustics do this all the time because the ocean's not uniform. When the wavelength is small compared to the characteristic distance over what something's changing, the speed of sound or something like that, you're not going to get reflections. Is that, is that reasonable? It's kind of reasonable to you, right? So I got this wavelength like this. When the medium is changing slowly compared to a wavelength, there's going to be very little reflections. In, f in fact, they're extremely small because, well, I don't want to get into this, it has to do with what's called adiabatic invariance. Google that. I've never done it, but it's a, it's a fascinating phenomenon in physics. But I think it's, let's just, let's, let's not get into that. When the wavelength, what should be important here when a wavelength sees an abrupt discontinuity or, or a very slow one is, is the, you know, the length of the transition here compared to a wavelength. And um, it's, it's totally irrelevant here because the impedance is matched all the way along here. I don't think it matters. So whether you have, whether this is very smooth here, you know, compared to a wavelength, or whether it's abrupt, like I drew it before, I don't think it's going to matter. Unless I'm making a mistake. It sort of just depends on the kind of wave. Because if you had a... Uh, well, we're talking about longitudinal waves here. Is it, when, when you say kind of, you mean we're talking about other types of waves yeah, in the yeah. system? If you had a transverse wave, the impedance would be different. Uh, yeah. So yeah, we're gonna, we'll see that, actually. Okay, so I'll try to remember to bring this up when we do flexural waves. Next week, okay. Yeah, this is amazing. I, I have, I'm gonna have to think. I just thought about this right before class. I got. I'm gonna have to. This just doesn't seem right. <laughs> but the math is telling us. You know, it's right there. So, and then from a deeper physical point of view, again, you know, we would look at how the the wave impedance changes, and it's the it, wave impedance doesn't change. So that's telling us that there are no reflections. Wow. Okay, we looked at simple boundary conditions. Okay, and everything is just like a string, but there is one difference. The motion here is longitudinal, not transverse. So you don't see this, but if you plot the displacement here on the y-axis and, you know, x on the x-axis, you're going to see something. It looks just like a string. But again, it's harder to, to visualize because it's, it's longitudinal, it's not transverse. But it's mathematically the same. And we get these modes. This is for fixed, fixed, and um, free, free. It's going to look like this. It's the same frequency spectrum, right? I want to emphasize this because I didn't do this with a string. I don't think I emphasize this with the strings. We've got a half wavelength here. That's going to give us a, a frequency we can calculate. We get the same frequency here because we have a half wavelength. The waveform is different, it's shifted, but the, the frequency spectrum is the same. The, all these modes are harmonics of the fundamental. This is twice the frequency, three times, etc. The next thing we want to do is mixed boundary conditions. So we have free fixed. Okay, this is again, this is going to be just like a string, and you can remember this from a string here. These mixed boundary conditions are interesting, and, it, and it's uh, now that I think about it, um, you can utilize this. You'll notice we get a quarter wavelength here. We're half the frequency down. The fundamental here is half the frequency b before because of the mi because we have the mixed boundary conditions. So this is utilized in um, organ pipes. For uh, people s stumbled onto this empirically hundreds of years ago. So you want to have a you, you know you got a cathedral and you got a huge organ all these organ pipes and you want to get really low frequency. You can save yourself the trouble of having a very long pipe by cutting it in half and then blocking the end. So that'll because the the driven in here, I don't I don't I've never m remember the names, but you know there's a hole right in an organ pipe where you that with a thing that kind of splits the flow of the air and that's what somehow causes the excitation of a mode there. That's acting like a free end, it's open end. Okay. So, if you take the other end and block it, and that's what they called it, 
centuries ago, and they still do. Now you're getting mixed boundary conditions, and um, <coughs> the fundamental is half the frequency. So it's convenient, right? Especially when you, you're going for the really low, low wavelengths. Okay, now there's something you want to notice here, and I don't think I talked... Uh, oh, again, you know, this is this, a string would look like this, the bar is doing this, same as before. Um, oh, and the general solution here, and you want to add an e to the... Uh, you need to multiply by e to the i omega n t, that's missing here. Put it, So what does the spectrum look like here compared to a bar of the same length but with free-free or fixed-fixed boundary conditions? What we can do, again, uh, as I told you guys, I think one-dimensional graphs are, are um, what's the word, uh, uh, are underestimated, undervalued, I, there's a word I can't find, are underappreciated. Underrated? Underrated. That's the word. Okay, good. I'm glad we figured that out. <laughs> I think one dimensional graphs are underrated. This is a one dimensional graph here. Things are displaced this way just for clarity. So here's frequency. We got this one dimension, it's frequency. And here are the modes. We have a fixed, uh, we have a bar of a certain length. And it, it, whether it's fixed, fixed, or free, free, it's going to have the same spectrum here. It's going to have a fundamental, and the next mode up is going to be twice. These are going to all be all harmonic. This is twice the frequency of this, as I've tried to sketch it here, right? This is the origin, it's zero there. Okay, when we uh, take this bar of the same length but mix the boundary conditions, the fundamental drops by a factor of two, because it's a quarter wavelength, okay? And then, where's the second harmonic of the fundamental? We'd expect to see and the next mode here, it's, that's not a mode. The next mode is three times the frequency. Right? You can see it, it's right here. So this has an important consequence. Um, musically, if, um, you know, any musical instrument is going to have some overtone and harmonic structures, some higher tones here. It's not going to be exactly pure. Unless it's coming from some synthesizer. I'm not into that, but anybody into electronic? <laughs> um, I guess with a, I don't know, okay? I don't know if that's is an option there if you're playing a, you know, keyboard synthesizer to have just play pure tones, you know, just a pure frequency. It really doesn't sound very interesting, okay? And in fact, the reason, the way, I think I might have told you this before, the, the way we can distinguish different um, musical instruments playing the same pitch, same frequency, same fundamental frequency here, is the, the overtone structure. We can identify, we, and it's naturally, we've learned that in our brains, that we can identify instruments by what the relative amplitudes are here. And there's a fundamental difference between the overtone structure. These are all harmonic. And this, we would look at this and we, would, we can describe it by saying, well, it's, it's missing the, the even harmonics, the second, the fourth, the sixth. You will hear that. You'll hear that. This will. Um, if I played two tones here with the same fundamental frequency, one where there are all the harmonics here, then where you where we remove those, you'll hear a difference. It won't sound as interesting. It'll be definitely different. So here's. This has happened before in this class. We need a demo of this. So I've made a note this time. It happened before, and I can't remember where it, when it where it came up. Um, was it this? <laughs> no, I don't know. Um, we need a, some kind of demonstration synthesizer where you can dial up a tone and then whatever harmonic structure you want. I should say overtone. Harmonics are mul you know, integer multiples. Overtones can be anything. So I really should use the more general word overtone here. You want to play this and then be able to s zero out these and then go back and put them in and, and listen to it. And another advantage of that is if we change the relative amplitudes here, all the amplitudes are important relative to the fundamental amplitude here, it will sound, it'll have a different tone for you. And you'll say, oh, that sounds like a flute because we got close to the overtone structure before. That sounds like an oboe. 
something like that, okay? So it's, yeah, all this stuff was done empirically by master craftsmen making musical instruments over centuries, long before quantitative, you know, analytical acoustics came about. And I don't know if I mentioned to you guys, but there's still a long way to go, right? Because nobody's made a Stradivarius, except Stradivarius. Did I talk about that before? No. Okay, well I just did. So, uh, the people claim to, there, I remember there was a claim, uh, it was like the early, t mid 2000s, and what's some Swiss people? said, okay, we, we got it nailed down. We're gonna make a synthetic violin. We're making a synthetic violin, not subject to humidity, temperature. That's nice, right? Yes. Like that gets musicians interested, and it's gonna sound like a Stradivarius. So it was in the New York Times, a big deal. We're almost there, and then nobody ever heard about it anymore. So take a wild guess what happened. It doesn't sound like a Stradivarius, <laughs> okay? When somebody does that, I think everyone in the world, in the modern world, is going to know. Okay, so they still have a long, that right there tells you there's a still a long way to go. What's a Stradivarius? Google it. An old violin. Are you serious? Oh, I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So these were violins made in like the 1500s by a guy. Named, I think they had, he had a family, the son, or, or there was a son or something. But they're, uh, they're now worth millions of dollars, these violins, because they have a tone that, that is clearly <laughs> distinguished by musicians. And even the public, I think, can, you can tell, you know. I, I don't know, it's hard, it's hard. But, but um, there's, for professional musicians, there's no question about it. These are far, by far, the best violins. So Wikipedia has it as a uh, Finnish metal band. Power metal band, formed in, the <laughs> formed in 1984. <laughs> The violin after. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I'm I don't know what you're saying. What are you saying? So, Stradivarius is a, is the name of the Finnish power movement. <laughs> First instrument. Wow. Oh. Clearly, <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's this intimate connection, you know, between acoustics and music, and it, and it's interesting. It's really interesting. Okay, so now we did, those are the simple boundary conditions. So next, let's, this will look familiar to you. We, I think we, we did this for a string. This is a free, oh, we're gonna look for, you see there's no drive here, and I'm specifying free, so these are, we're gonna look for normal modes here. But it's of course intimately connected when you add a force, because um, for a force drive, the normal modes here will be the same as the resonant modes for a force drive. So it's the same, it's just a slightly different point of view. And it's, a free, it's free here, and it's loaded with a mass here. And the first thing you encounter here, I know this from teaching transducers, and I, get, and I probably got this from KFCS. So that means one of those guys, Kinsler, Fry, Coppins, and Sanders, at least one of them was an underwater acoustician. I think we can infer that. And if, if anybody wants to investigate that, let me know the results. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do it. <laughs> okay. Why am I saying this? Because this, this comes up in sonar where you mass load something. So here, look what we have here. We've got some kind of solid material here. We have a solid material here. It's not jello, okay? There, and we're looking for waves in here. Can we treat this like a point mass? Ooh. In general, <coughs> the answer is no. There are gonna be waves inside that material. So it's only if this, the characteristic dimension here, is small compared to a wavelength in this material. That's what this means, that's what this confusing equation looks like here. In the mass here, there's gonna, this is going to be made of some material, it's going to have its own speed of sound, we've got some frequency out here. If the wavelength, this is the wavelength inside the material, if it's much greater than this dimension, then we can treat it like a point mass. So this is standard. Uh, underwater transduction stuff. They, you get warned about this really early. Because uh, often in sonar, and we'll talk more about this, often in sonar um, transducers, it's mass loaded, or loadings on there. And so you want to know if you can treat them like appointments, or do you have to deal with the waves inside here, which you usually don't want to do unless you have to. This makes it more complicated. 
That would be like two bars, right? <laughs> like we're connecting two bars. And it, the, in general, the material is different. Okay. Um, so how do we handle this? Well, I, I want to encourage you to jump. Here, we can do this, you know. We've done it many times before. Right traveling, left traveling. But we know we have to have a solution of the wave equation. Standing wave solution. So we're going to have an e to the i omega t multiplied by a sinusoid. And we've got to have zero slope here at, at x equals zero. So I can immediately write down, or almost immediately write down, that the displacement here is going to be a cosine of proportional to some amplitude times the cosine of kx times e to the i omega t. So that's, once you get used to that, it just makes life easier. But you can go through this if you want to. Um, now let's apply, we can look at this from an impedance point of view, but I think it's easy to just use Newton's second law. We have a boundary, we've in, enforced this, you know, we've put in this boundary condition, the cosine right here. Now we've got this other boundary condition, and we don't know what it is. We have to derive it. We derive it from Newton's second law. The force on the mass, which is the force of the bar here, and we know what that is. Where is it? Hit. The force of a bar at a point, the force of the left part of the bar at a point on the right part of the bar is given by this expression. It's just like a string, right down to the minus sign when we're going this way, and this plays the role of the tension here. Remember that from yesterday? And for a string we would have d, the slope, dy dx. Here we have the rate of change of displacement. Again, it's harder to visualize. A string is just the slope. We're going to take the force and multiply slope to get, to get the restoring force here. It's nice because it's perpendicular to the medium. But it's the same, the mathematics is the same. So this is the force that we derived yesterday. We plugged that into the left hand side of the equation. We set it equal to the mass times the acceleration. And then we substitute in the form here. And the amplitude is going to cancel out. This is all linear. We're doing all linear waves here. So the amplitude is gone. And you get, and you knew this was coming, because we get a transcendental equation. We get an equation. We now have to solve for the dimensionless quantity KL. The problem is it appears in these trig functions here, but it also appears just algebraically, because omega is equal to CK. So what do you do? You beat on it. And to encourage you to learn this, I put it into the, the quiz. That was a recent change, the quiz that's just the past quiz, right? So, and we went through this before for strings, same, same case here. It looks kind of complicated here, so you start playing around. First thing you do is, we want to think of K, or actually KL, it's better, as the unknown. So we get rid of omega, we substitute CK, okay? And I get K squared, but one of, one of the cases is going to cancel with this. And um, now, it's, uh, this is one of those things that you know by experience, you know, when you first hit this, you wonder why is somebody doing this? What's, what's the whole point? Well, the point is we want to make this as physically transparent as possible. And the guide to doing that is put, go to dimensionless variables. This is a dimensionless variable or dimensionless and dimensionless parameters. And you can see here that if I get rid of the c squared here, and replace it with the Young's modulus divided by the density. I can cancel the Young modulus there, but also what happens is when I multiply by L over L, which I'm going to do because KL is the natural dimensionless variable here, look what appears in the denominator. What's that? This is the density of the bar times the cross-sectional area times the length. It's the mass per unit volume times the volume. It's the mass of the bar. We'll call it m sub b. I think we called it, we called it m sub s before. Same thing for the string. So this is really important. I've, I've said this before. I'm going to say it again. Our final transcendental equation here is the tangent of kl, this dimensionless unknown kl, is minus the ratio of the masses here. What's important, this mass by itself can't be important. It has to be, you have to compare it to some other mass.
And what the math has told us, and it really has to because there's no other mass in town except the mass of the bar, is what's important is the, the determination mass divided by the mass of the bar. When this ratio is small, you've got essentially a free condition. Right? You know, just saying m is equal to zero or m is equal to infinite is really evading the issue here. Especially if you wanted to do an experiment. Because you can't have an infinite mass, for one thing, obviously. So uh, it's more important for the, when you do have a mass, then when the mass becomes very small. And you can imagine that there's no mass on here. Imagining zero is no problem. But how big do I have to make this mass for this n to be approximately fixed? Well, the answer is it should be substantially greater than the mass of the bar. That's what sets the scale here. So that's why this is a nice form to shoot for. Uh, we got the same, and we got the same expression for the string. Remember that this is exactly the same as the string. Remember this? This was, the, this was our first encounter of a transcendental equation, right? I think was this case for the string. I'm pretty sure. Um, and you know how to do this. I don't need to explain to you. You know, there's a standard graphical method here. We plot, you know, this function as a function of KL. We plot this function. And where it intersects, those are going to give us, when we read on the axis here, that's going to give us solutions, the normal mode, that, you know, values for KL. And from that, we can get the frequencies and the wavelength, wavelengths. And you remember the special cases? <clears throat> Let's verify this. When the mass on the end is much less, the terminating mass is much less than the mass of the bar, we're going to have just a slight slope here, which means our solutions are going to be close to integral multiples of pi. And that has to be true because it's a free, free bar. Right? When the mass on the end here is small, we've got a free, free bar. So we know it has to, con that's a special case that our general boundary condition, more general boundary condition with some arbitrary terminating, ma terminating mass here. It's got to reduce to free free bar when m is small compared to the mass of the bar. And it does. Integral multiples of pi. What about the other limit when the mass is big? And by big we mean big compared to the mass of the bar. Now I'm going to have a really steep slope here. And now you can see that the solutions correspond to half integral multiples of pi. And it's the problem with the words here. When we say half integral, we really mean, you, you know, this is 2 times pi over 2, right? When we say half integral, we really mean that here we're skipping the integral values. So it's pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, etc. And those, that's the mixed boundary condition that we were just talking about. That's the mixed boundary condition mm -hmm. we get uh, yeah, this is the best way to look at it. These are the, those are the, that's the spectrum. Okay, any questions so far? So now you see why we do strings, right? It really helps, it makes this a lot easier. You wouldn't want to just dive right into bars, but it happens that people have to do that, right? They're doing some kind of research or something and they don't, this happens in acoustics a lot. People get in. Nonlinear works oppositely. I'm sorry. Nonlinear works oppositely, right? You do bars first. Right? Oh. <laughs> right. right. Y yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> you just jump into sound. <coughs> yeah. So hopefully we'll offer the nonlinear course next spring, right? Forty-four fifty-nine. <laughs> you guys, are your matrices all mapped out? For your stay here, uh, I don't know. That it, I, I don't know that it includes like the acoustics, like the track courses. But my, at least mine doesn't. I mean, it just has like quantum and stuff. Oh, it doesn't have elective. The four, forty-four fifty-nine is an elective. Yeah. It, it would oh yeah. So you can take that or general relativity. So we compete with general relativity. And in the past, it's it's. Usually, you know, 50-50. Some students take both. That's kind of a little. Pardon me? Can you replace one of my literacy warfare classes? As far as I'm concerned, you can replace all those BS <laughs> courses you guys take. That I would be great. It just cuts into the research, you know? <laughs> yeah, tell them I said so. They're not, not going to care. What. Uh, the distance learning students don't, don't take, uh, we don't, offer that, but I, someday I hope we do, because it's fascinating. 
right? Yeah, it's uh, nonlinear stuff. It's just all kinds of new phenomena occur. Um, now, you know, the standard thing when you do any kind of science is you look for applications, right? Because we're not mathematicians. If we were mathematicians, we wouldn't. We would be thinking about the next mathematical thing that may or may not have anything to do with reality, right? But we're not mathematicians, we're scientists. So we naturally look for applications. So here's a possible one. I, I don't know if anyone's ever used this, but that doesn't mean they haven't or they won't. But suppose you have, let's say, an underwater projector, a, a transmitter of sound, and it's a high amplitude drive. Off whatever the drive may be, you're putting electrical energy in, you want to convert it to acoustic energy. Often the problem with high amplitude drives is nonlinearity. You get harmonics of the, fun, of the fundamental. The drive is not clean. This happens all the time. You take a loudspeaker and drive it at low amplitude, you'll, you'll hear a nice pure tone, you can put a microphone on it and look at the FFT or look at it on a scope, or whatever. You, you drive it harder and harder, which eventually, what's eventually going to happen? Hooke's law breaks down. It starts um, hitting its maximum amplitude. So it's kind of a you know, somewhat abrupt thing. And you can see that in the sound that's being generated. You'll see these all kinds of harmonics. Suppose you want to get rid of the harmonics. Suppose you don't want those. So what some people, have, some companies have done, believe it or not, is for woofers, they will have a, um, an accelerometer, a little accelerometer on there. And they'll, they'll have a feedback circuit to keep it harmonic so that it doesn't, dist it's called distortion, incident. That's what they mean by distortion. It's nonlinearity coming in. Breakdown of for a loudspeaker, it's a breakdown of Hooke's law. Um, so one thing you can do here for an underwater source of sound is you can use a have the driver drive a bar, and this there are a lot of bars get used in underwater acoustics, as 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 we will see. Okay. So suppose and you want to drive, let's say the fundamental mode here. Okay. How much are you going to excite? Your, your drive has these ugly harmonics that you want to get rid of. What, are you going to excite these modes? No, they're not harmonic. Can you see? You know, these, these are they're harmonic in this limit, and they're kind of every other you know, harmonic in the, in the other limit. But in between, these aren't <coughs> harmonic. These aren't harmonic. So you, you can clean up the drive. This is a trick to clean up the drive. Again, I don't know if anyone's ever done this, but you know, they could. Or maybe they have, I don't know. And I just realized there's something else I forgot to say here. What happened to this solution? We just rejected that for a string. Because a string, we have to have it under tension. We have to have some kind of frame, you know, something to keep it under tension. But here we've got just this bar. It could be out in space, and we get waves on the bar. We don't have to have some kind of contraption here in the laboratory. So. The math is telling us that there's a solution at zero frequency. And what do you think? Well, I'll tell you what it is here. But what it is is the uniform mode that's just moving along with constant velocity. That's a, a, clearly a mode here. You know, th ima again, imagine a bar out in space. And we're asking for the normal modes, modes of definite frequency. Zero is a solution. So it's returning to us actually something that uh, can really happen for a bar if it's, you know, if you're out in space. <laughs> Uh, okay, any questions? So we're going to do, we're sort of going over previous string stuff, but in more depth now, I think, and talking more about music and what we did with strings, <laughs> which is counterintuitive, I guess. The other thing we want to do here is talk about this mode mapping. I mentioned to you that it's um, sometimes useful, especially in a laboratory, to, uh, you want to know how the system, the response of the system is going to change if you change a parameter of the system. And it comes up here because, um, you know, we can imagine, we can imagine slowly changing the mass on the end. And we can ask what happens to a mode 
That's the natural question that people ask. And usually they're asking it, first of all, it's actually interesting, but usually they're, you ask that question because you want, you're trying to alter your system to get it to do something. It's not behaving the way you want it to behave, so you want to, you maybe you want a lower frequency. So you can ask these type of questions. What happens as, what happens as you slowly change your parameter? What's ha what happens to a mode? So we can see this mathematically. We can just look going from, um, you know, we can go from here from a free free bar and, and imagine slowly moving this down and you can see what the solution, you can see it mathematically. But we can, uh, I'm gonna emphasize the physical way of looking at it here and get the same results. Let's start off with a, the terminating mass being negligible, okay? So we have free free boundary conditions. Here's the fundamental. As I slowly add mass, What's going to happen to the frequency of that normal mode? This is a normal mode. And you always have normal modes. They're always going to be there. It may not be obvious what they are. And here we don't know, we can't calculate, we can't analytically calculate the frequency, right? It's a transcendental equation. But qualitatively, if I add mass to the end, what's going to happen to add a little bit of mass? What's, the frequency is going to go down, right? Because we're mass loading it. So now if you don't buy that, you can do the mathematical approach. You can just look at this. But this is more interesting. <laughs> so this, if the frequency goes down, the wavelength goes down, the wavelength has to get bigger. So this node, as I slowly increase the mass here, this node is going to move this way, right? And finally, when the mass is very large compared to the mass of the bar, the node will be right at the end. So in this case, the fundamental free free maps into the fundamental free fix. This is the fundamental mode, okay? But it's not always the case. We encountered one where it wasn't the case. So that's a, a warning there when you map modes. Don't assume that the fundamental mode at one special case maps into the fundamental mode. It, it, just look back in the notes. You'll, I can't remember what it was, but it's, um, it didn't happen there. But here it's, it, it's, it happens, but it's not a general phenomenon. So we can see this maps into here. Here's the next mode up. When I start adding mass, the wavelength's going to have to have to increase. So what it does is these nodes migrate, you know, this way as we slowly increase the mass, and eventually this node's going to be right at the end. That's when we've reached the very large mass on the end. Uh, another thing, underwater sound, people deal with bars a lot. Where, let's say you've got a situation like this. This happens a lot. Where do you want to support the bar? You, you have a resonant bar. You're using a resonant bar in your projector. Where do you want it? You've got to support it. You just can't let it be freely flo floating in the oil, in the, in the booting there. So where do you support it? Any wild guesses? <laughs> How about the node, the displacement node? Yeah. Because if I support it anywhere else, I'm going to highly damp that mode. So this is done. So I've heard. I've never done it. I, but um, this is standard in underwater sonar transducers. Uh, okay, any questions? Or comments? So, how do we handle general boundary conditions? Well, you know it's coming. So again, this is a normal mode. We don't have an external drive here, but you know, this carries over to an external drive. The normal modes here will be the resonances when you put, it, when you put a drive on here. So we're just gonna look at the normal, from the normal mode because it's a little, a little simpler. We would, in general, we would characterize a termination by an impedance and it's not the impedance seen by an external drive, because we have no external drive. It's the impedance seen by the bar. So when we, we talked a little bit about this before. There's nothing, you know, impedance is a general concept. It's not necessarily associated with an, some external force drive. It could be, you know, just with the medium. From this point of view here, this is the impedance seen by this medium. And by the impedance we, we're going to meet, we mean, of course, the complex force divided by the complex velocity. And the advantage of using impedance is we can just write these down. Once we have an equivalent electric circuit, we can just easily come up with the 
impedance here, in typical cases. So how do we mathematically express this? Well, the impedance is going to be the complex force divided by the complex velocity at the, at the origin here, at the, at the left end. You'll notice that I've got a minus sign here. Why do I have to have, have a minus sign there? Well, the easiest way to see, here's an explanation, but the easiest way to see this is, you remember what this F is? This is the, the this is the force. We have a bar, and there's some point here at some location x. This is the force of the left side of the bar on the right side of the bar at, at, at this point. That's just the natural definition. And when it's positive, it's this way, and when it's negative, it's this way. When it's positive, it's causing a compression. Remember I told you about that? When it's negative, it's causing an expansion. So here, The, the force of the bar is the force of the right side acting on this side. We have to take, we have to put a minus sign here because what we care about is the force of the right side of the bar on our termination here. So we have to take this, this F that we're using here and we, we have a formula for it, right? F is minus SY times the partial, we, we derive that. The point here is that we need to take minus that because we're going the bar is exerting a, um, the bar is on the right side, it's not on the left side. So that's why we have a minus sign here, because this force refers to the left on the right. And by Newton's third law, the force of the right on the left is going to be just a minus sign. Um, Okay, the velocity, of course, is the rate of change of displacement with respect to time evaluated at the origin. We have a similar boundary condition here, but of course now there's no minus sign because it's the left side of the bar that's going to be the force. We don't, we don't put a minus, we can't put a minus sign here to be correct. Okay, so this is the whole idea. This is how, by the, the convenience of impedance here, we can usually come up pretty easily with what these uh, impedances are here. And then we can, we don't have to explicitly go through Newton's second law. It's all in the impedance. This is equivalent to Newton's second law, as we've seen. It's just much easier to deal with. Uh, okay, so uh, now this is just what I was saying before. Our viewpoint here is that, okay, let me, let me say it this way. Suppose we add an external drive here. Now what do I have to do? Now how do I modify the, for the impedance approach? What do I do? Well now what's important is the impedance seen by the drive, right? So we've got to add this impedance to what? To the bar plus this. And you don't just add these. <laughs> you have to use the impedance translation formula. We'll see more of that in, in a moment, okay? But I just want to make sure you get the, there's a distinction here, you know. When we add a drive, what's important is the impedance seen by the drive. That'll be the whole thing here. But from our normal mo mode point of view, this impedance right here is just the impedance of this because this is our drive, the bar is our drive. Um, okay, now we need to transform this a little bit this is really not convenient. It may look like it's convenient to you. You say, oh, we can just look up Young's moduluses. But then we have some kind of cross-sectional area. But we know that the cross-sectional area doesn't play a role, right? So that's an indication right there that it'll be good to get rid of that. What we can do here, it's very simple, and I've done it right here. You can see that I've multiplied and divided by rho because y over rho is c squared, right? And then, what is S times rho? This is going to be the mass, I think we've seen this before, this is the mass per unit length. That's really the relevant quantity, well, that's a relevant parameter as we're seeing here for a bar, which is not surprising because it's one dimensional. You would guess that that would you know, play a role. So it's easier for us, it's more convenient, instead of dealing with this, to deal with rho L C squared. And you can look this up, values of this for different materials, and you can look this up. And most people look this up. Speed of sound, is, you can look up for just about anything. 
And incidentally, it's, it's easier to determine this more accurately than some of these other quantities. The Young's modulus is um, typically found statically. So the speed of sound values can be determined more accurately. There's another advantage to this. Now it's identical to a string. <laughs> the, the mathematics here is now, this is just what we got for a string. Except there, of course, c squared is the tension divided by the linear density. But we've got the same, same expression here. So our two boundary conditions here, you know, th this one and this one, what they boil down to are these two expressions right here. And this, these are, uh, this is general for um, whatever impedance you may have here and whatever impedance you may have there. So they sit right there. Uh, we all saw this, I think we, we, does this seem familiar? I think we did this for a string. I, I, I didn't have, I didn't look back, but we had either identical to this or something very similar to this for a string when we looked at the general boundary conditions. Now, we're, so we're going to take this a little bit further than we did before. We talked about this before. What if we have a resistive element? What if there's some resistance in here? Suppose these aren't purely reactive, like we have tend to be been, been dealing with. Well, okay, we're still going to have normal modes. What's going to happen to them as time goes on? They're going to damp out because of the, because of the damping. Because now we have resistive elements in there. So the way, as we mentioned before, the way to handle this is to go complex. It's not obvious, unless you think about it. Is to go complex with the frequency and the wave number. And the way we, the, the reason it is kind of a natural, maybe it's not obvious, but it is sort of a natural thing to do is when you multiply this times t and the e to i to the, I to the omega t, we're going to get an exponential decay there, which we know is what's, what's going to happen in linear waves and oscillations when you have damping and you're not driving them. You're not driving the oscillation, you're not overcoming it. You're going to get exponential decay. That's, um, it always or nearly always happens for linear systems. So we go complex here. And you know, if you don't like what I just said, I, I, I'm, that's fine with me. Um, just accept this for the, mo for the time being and you'll see that it, where it leads to is it's the right way to try to solve these problems. Now, we've made these complex. We're going to assume we have no damping in the bar, so we have the exact wave equation in the bar. So we have to have omega is equal to ck. If we generalize <coughs> omega to become complex, we have to actually generalize k. Um, so we have to have, for the stand, by no damping, I'm, I mean the, the bar is, obeys the standard wave equation, apart from the terminations. So we have to have omega is equal to ck. Um, and now, what do we do? Well, we have the wave equation. We know that the general solution is going to be a right traveling wave and a left traveling wave. It, you know, it's more, much more potentially much more complicated here, right, because of this complex numbers. But the idea is the same. Right traveling plus left traveling. We impose the boundary conditions. Here they are. These things right here. And you can do this in your head. If you just stare at it. On our waveform here. And here's what we get. At x is equal to zero, it's not very complicated because x is equal to zero. However, and we can simplify this a little bit. Yeah, I've used the dispersion relationship. Omega is equal to ck to cancel these. And get, have a c, cancel one of those c's. At x equals l, it's going to get more complicated. Do you see why? Because it's x equals l. <laughs> we can't get rid of these e to the i k l. So this is very common. This is this part of the... You know, what's operating under here is the impedance translation formula. It's operating even though we... We're not really seeing it, but um, you'd expect this. So this equation, the other boundary condition, is, is just more complicated. And you might say, oh, why don't we move our origin to L? Then this will become simple. And of course, what's the problem with that? This one will not be simple, okay? So, but, but sometimes it is to our advantage to ch properly choose the origin. We will see examples of that somewhere this quarter or next, I don't know where. I just remember that it happens. happens. 
Um, now, how many unknowns do we have here? This is a good question. And I, and you don't, I didn't write the answer down, so you can't read it. How many unknowns? We have two equations. They're complex. How many unknowns? Two. Well, it better be two, right? Because this shouldn't uniquely specify. It better be two. What are they? A and B. A and B. Yeah, that's possible. Okay, remember, this is linear acoustics, right? What's important is just the ratio of A over B. If I double A and double B, it's going to be a solution. So one of the unknowns is actually B over A. What's the other unknown? Let's not forget, we don't know our normal modes, KL. So we have two complex equations, and we have really two complex unknowns, B over A and KL. So the first thing to do here is to limit, get rid of B over A. And one way of doing it is solve this for B, which is easy to do, plug it into here, and then you'll see the A's cancel. So you really don't have to go through the ratio thing. It'll just naturally cancel. And look at this. Okay, does any... Uh-oh. Oh, yeah. Okay, hold on. Yeah. Okay, so this is what we get. This... This is what we get. So we've gotten this kind of thing before. This is much more general now, and we haven't specified the impedances, but this is going to be a, um, because this KL will naturally occur in these impedances here, this is going to be a transcendental equation. And it's not real. It's complex, remember? So I don't know how you solve <laughs> this. Would you, uh, you know, I don't know if there's any graphical way. I never thought about it, I can be honest with you. Um, but you can use a you know complex root finder. It can be done, and those will represent the the normal modes of the system, <coughs> which will damp out in time, and we will get the damping the damping parameter. What we will also find, because you know when we find this complex K, we're getting the complex omega. So we're getting not just the frequencies of the modes, but their decay constants too. Okay, any uh, questions or comments? So we'll finish longitudinal waves tomorrow. All right.